continue in our series, Ordinary People. This is lesson two. <clears throat> John chapter four, we're going to read verse nine through 15. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which give us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I may thirst not, neither come hither to draw. John 4, verse 28 to 30. The woman then left her pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Heavenly Father, bless us right now in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Ordinary people, I want to talk about, as we read here, the woman of the well. But today I want to talk about being a witness. A witness. Amen. See, the Lord gave us an example in witnessing by the way he de dealt with this woman of Samaria. The woman received salvation and became an effective witness. People who have not been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb should certainly tell it. I'm sorry, people who have been redeemed. What's going on here this morning? I get to one of those days. But no one is excluded from giving his testimony of the work of Jesus Christ in his life. That's for all of us. Amen. We should tell of the ability of the Lord to save the lost to all people everywhere. Ordinary people who have received an extraordinary supernatural experience should be eager to relate the good news to other people. Amen. Every redeemed person has a story. Right? Right? We all have a story to tell. The Lord of the harvest did not call us to be clever. He did not call us to be spectacular, showy, or brilliant. But he called us to be a witness. Praise the Lord. You see, the, the Samaritans were people of a mixed race. Renegade Jewish remnants intermarried with the Assyrians and others who had settled there. These heathen people were idolatrous, and they had very little compassion of uh, the God, uh, or, or comprehension, I'm sorry, of the God of Israel. But the intermingling of idolatry corrupted even their knowledge of the God of Israel by some Israelite, by, like Jeroboam, who introduced the worship of the golden calves to the Samaritans. And all these factors created the environment into which the woman of, the, a woman of Samaria was born, and they contributed to her life of complete disarray. She was a troubled and confused woman when she met the master at, Samaria, at the Samaritan well. You see, folks, family problems arise because people don't know God in the way they should. The Samaritan woman's parents may not have had a copy of the, the Pentateuch, for they lived in the midst of the heathen Samaritan culture. And it is not likely that her parents observed the teachings of Moses during her formative years. 
So whatever the background of the woman of Samaria, her life was in utter turmoil. And when Jesus came to her, she had not suffered only one failed marriage, but five failed marriages. And she was living with the sixth man of whom Jesus correctly identified as not being her husband. And this was the experience of the Samaritan woman. Satan, folks, is attacking families. He's attacking homes in unprecedented fashion in our world today. He realizes that if he can destroy these, he can destroy the entire fabric of a civilization. But people who follow the teachings of Scripture concerning family relationships, it, they inoculate themselves against the works of the satanic forces. So they assume, they assure themselves that of God's blessing upon their home. There are moral problems, and too often moral problems are the root of family problems. The marriage vow is sacred and must be upheld with sober respect. You see, two individuals taking the, the, the marriage vows promise to forsake all others. And keep themselves only unto each other as long as they both shall live. Of the three avenues Satan uses uh, to tempt humanity, he most often uses the lust of the flesh to attack a person's moral purity. In 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is the world, in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, it's important and right for a couple to keep themselves morally pure for each other and for the sake of their personal salvation. But it is equally important that they remain for the sake of their children. You see, the task of rearing children is, or in this permissive society, provides quite a challenge to every family. Amen? But the eternal destiny of children, folks, may be determined by what they are taught and by what is modeled before them in the home. Come on. You see, old-fashioned purity is still right. Come on. Are we awake here this morning, folks? <laughs> Once the marriage agreement is made, it is made for life. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to remarry to whom she will only in the Lord. The same is true for the husband. Divorce has never been the will of God. In Matthew 19, 8 through 10, Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for the marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. There is a plethora of moral issues today, folks, that threaten the purity and the integrity of today's families like no ever, no other time. Child molestation, incest, pornography, filthy movies, ungodly television programs have inundated our society, producing emotionally scarred people who have difficulty coping with life. And also there is an increased acceptance of homosexual behavior in our time that is abominable in the sight of God. As a result of declining morals and values in, in general, people, people's ideas of what is morally acceptable is distorted. You see, to live in accordance, according to the precepts of God's word, is a strong difference to many family problems. It's a deterrent to the families. Jesus is not a way of eternal life. He is the way. 
The only access to God is through his death, burial, and resurrection. You see, the knowledge of this truth, folks, brings with it a great responsibility to take the whole gospel to the whole world. The people of God must proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ with fervor, with intensity, with great zeal. And false religions have done as much to kindle the flames of hatred that bring division between nations, between families, between individuals, and, and any single tactic of Satan. History is replete with ugly stories of wars fought um, and blood shed over religious differences. But the Samaritan woman also was blinded by false religion, and it caused her concern about where she should worship. You see, she did not know whether to worship at the mountain where her forefathers had worshipped, or to whether she should worship at the temple at Jerusalem where it was, it was the proper place to worship. Now, to her statement of confusion, Jesus answered that whether worship was conducted in Jerusalem or in Samaria was not the point. But it, the point was how she worshipped was immeasurably important. In John 4, 21 to 24, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, thou, the hour cometh when ye shall re neither in the mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know that what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. All right? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> you see, Jesus led this Samaritan woman, folks. He led her to an understand that he was the Messiah and that the people of God were expecting, the, the, the Messiah that the people of God were expecting to come. He realized that Resolving her religious error would put her on the right path to solving her moral and family problems also. See, God realizes that and he understood it. If I could just get her on the right path, it will solve her family problems. It will solve her immorality. And folks, God wants us to understand that today. We, when we serve him with all of our heart, it solves a lot of the problems we have in our life. Even things that we uh, allow into our life because we don't understand. She, she, she didn't understand a lot of these things, and the Lord helped her. And then he realized this would help her get on the right path. You see, the supreme purpose of seeking the lost compi compelled the Lord to include a trip through Samaria. All right, understand, God, he wants people saved so much. He said, he realized, I, I can go meet this woman at the well. You think the disciples would have done that? No. But he was, Jesus was compelled to see souls saved, and he went and met this woman at the well. And with all the resentment and with all the animosity and, and the, uh, that existed between the residents of the Samaria and the Jews, it was not a desirable place to visit. <clears throat> but salvation, folks, salvation was not designed to remain only with the children of Abraham. Jesus went to Samaria to plant the seed of eternal life. He went there against accepted opinion of the day. And if the Lord could have been influenced by public opinion, there, were, there are many people who are in the kingdom of God who would have been excluded. You see, if this journey had been left to his disciples, it probably would have never happened. Jesus went to the woman of Samaria because he was concerned for her. It was a feeling of deep concern. 
for this sinful woman that caused Jesus to make this trip through Samaria. And first, you see, he, he knew that she was lost. This is still a matter of grave concern. In John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then also, Jesus also had compassion not only for the Samaritan woman, but also for all of humanity. The Holy Ghost, who is the Spirit of Christ, will cause us, folks, to go to the lost and show concern for their eternal destiny. Now, hear what I just said. The Holy Ghost in you, the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you, will cause you to go to the lost and to help them to know there's an eternal destiny that they need to choose between. If we don't go, what's that say about us in the Holy Ghost? We need to stir it up in us, like Paul told Timothy, right? Stir up that spirit. Amen. So, folks, it need, we need to understand, it's, it's not me and myself, but it's the spirit of God in me, that spirit of love that helps me to have compassion for those that aren't saved. There, there is no one so lost that God cannot save them. Now, I know we can look at people sometime and say, oh, man, I don't know if they'll ever be saved. <laughs> right? And so, sometimes we just ignore, uh, we just, uh, re I'm just not going to say anything to them. But understand, there is nobody so lost that God cannot save them. There is, you can probably say it about yourself today. If you knew where I came from, you'd probably say that about me. But see, there's no such thing as being just a little bit lost. Amen? You guys are a tough crowd this morning, I'm telling you. There's no such thing as being just a little bit lost. It is the true, for it is true that some people have gone to greater depths of sin than others. But everyone outside of Jesus Christ is lost. Everybody. You see, but looking at the Samaritan woman's life, one might never suspect that inwardly she desired deeply to live right. Now, we remember what Jesus told her. You know, you're not, uh, you, you know, this is your, you've had five husbands and the one you're living with is not your husband. Okay. So I'm sure the people in town had a, an opinion of her. Come on. And, if, you know, and, and, and anybody in there that would claim to be religious probably looked down their nose at her. Why else did she go to the well at a different time than all the other ladies? Because she probably heard a lot of little snide remarks about her. And that's the type of person that so, so often... Christians, well, oh, I don't know if they'd ever be saved. But see, folks, God saw something in this woman. He saw an inward desire that she wanted to live right, a deep desire. She had searched for fulfillment. She had searched for satisfaction in the wrong places. And by gratifying the base desire that are born of fleshly lust, her life had become empty. Empty. And the hunger inside was growing with every wrong turn she made. She probably just think, I just, keep, I just keep messing up. I have no good luck with men. I always pick these jerks. Come on, think about it. And, and, and you know how it is? It's when, 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 when the honeymoon period is over, then it starts getting ugly. And then she says, look at I, I don't know if I want to live with this. And so sure, here she's on her sixth man. But that hunger kept growing because she kept messing up. Like, there's got to be something. You see, 
In her desperation, she resorted to going to, for the water at the most unlikely hour. She would not be a, apt to show her uh, discontentment to others if she were the only one at the well. But Jesus sensed the woman's sincerity. See, folks, we have to be, when we, we have to pray for people and say, God, open the door for us. God, if you will open the door, I will talk to this person. I will be there and just pray for them and say, God, give me compassion. Come on, folks. There's, there's people probably right now. I hope, you're, I hope you're thinking of people that you work with. I hope you're thinking of a family member. I hope you're thinking of a neighbor right now that said, God, help me to have compassion for that person. You see, folks, we have to have the heart of Jesus. I think this is awesome when you read about this. Jesus sensed this woman's sincerity. God, I want to be like you. By, by probing the depths of her spirit, Jesus discerned her inward misery. And he, folks, he also recognized that she was aware that she had spiritual, that she had spiritual needs. She was sincerely displeased with her lifestyle. So she, what she was doing, because she was displeased with her lifestyle, she longed to change, but lacked the strength to do that. Her inner conflict, it was very transparent to the Lord, as our conflict in our lives is also to Him. Folks, you're not hiding anything from God. Come on. We might as well make it known to him ourselves. That's what he wants to hear from us. God, I need you right now. See, Jesus, the one who possesses all knowledge, keenly observed her disappointment in how her life had gone. And in her condition, she was a prime target for the testimony of Jesus. Now, folks, Jesus found common ground with the Samaritan woman. See, this is one of the things we need to do. I, my pastor, I had a pastor tell me one time, he says, one of the ways I try to be apt and be ready is I read the newspaper. And when you're talking to people, if you find some kind of common ground from something that you read in the paper, it helps. And I thought, that is so neat. We need to understand, you know, what do we always talk about? This weather's crazy, isn't it? And that's about as far as it goes. Now, I used to talk about sports teams. I don't do it anymore. But, you know, you can always mention the Browns. Oh, there's always next year. Or you can say that about any of them. There's always next year. That's the motto around here. You see what I'm talking about, folks? If we can just try to help Jesus, you know what he found here? They had a, something in common. It was water. She was there for water, and he was there to tell her about living water. One of the most essential ingredients in sustaining physical life, because the plateau for the meeting of the minds between the witness and the hearer, the woman needed her, the woman's need for water was obvious as she approached the well. And in sharing with her needs for natural water, he also was able to establish a dialogue concerning living water. Jesus made a spiritual application about living water. The simple request by Jesus, he said, give me to drink. That unleashed a reply that revealed the pent-up hostility this woman felt toward the prejudice, uh, the prejudice the Jews had toward the Samaritans. See, well, how did that happen? Well, after he asked her for a drink of water, she vented her feelings. And Jesus countered with a statement that aroused her curiosity. He said in John 4, verse 10, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Stung by this in, in, in inference, 
that she was uninformed about whom she was talking with. And the ability that he, that Jesus possessed, she countered with questions. You see, but he was greater than Jacob, who gave them the well. He lacked the necessary bucket and rope to bring the water up to the surface. But it did not make sense to her from where he would draw his living water. <laughs> you see, little did the Samaritan woman realize, folks, that what was in store for her as she made her trip to that well. She was not expecting to meet Jesus. And probably the, the farthest thing from her mind was that she would receive a life-changing experience at Jacob's well. To her, the trip was just one more necessary chore for sustaining her life, dissatisfying as it was. But her unexpected encounter with Jesus relieved her burden, soul of guilt and condemnation. She met, folks, she met the master, and she would never be the same again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The miracle of God's grace that produces repentance had begun its work in her heart. The resentment against the Jews was being broken. Her lifestyle that she had followed suddenly became sinful to her. And she experienced a change in her heart. Now hear me what I said there. Her lifestyle that she had followed suddenly became Sinful to her. Why? Because she met Jesus. The world lives crazy ways, folks. But we need to help them to meet Jesus. And there's probably many of us could say this today. The lifestyle that I live, once I met Jesus, I realized was sinful. Now, as we grow as Christians, folks, we need to ask the Lord to help us to understand, Lord, is there anything else I need to get rid of in my life? You see, folks, my grandfather used to sing this old song, the shelf behind the door, don't need it anymore. And what he's talking about are these old things that we have stored away sometimes that we need to clean them out. We need to do some spring cleaning in our lives and say, God, help me, Lord, to... Lord, if I'm living in any way, David would say, David would say in the Word of God, Lord, search my heart. What is he doing? He's looking through, is there anything else in me? Is there any other way that I'm living that is displeasing to you? And if there is, God, I want to get rid of it. Lord, if there's things I need to bring into my life, I want to bring those parts in and put them up. A lifestyle that she was living now becomes sinful to her because she met the master. And every day, folks, I encourage you, every day in your life, be seeking God. Lord, is there anything, Lord, that, is, that I'm doing that is unpleasing to you? Is there anything, God, that I'm not doing that I should be doing that is unpleasing to you? And what I want you to po point out there, folks, is if we're not witnessing like we should, God, help me to do that. So that I can be pleasing to you. Because I'm telling you folks, listen. You go to places during your day, during your week, that God wants you to meet somebody. And you may even meet them, but what are you saying to them? Are you meeting your Samaritan woman at the well? That God wants to speak to you to help that person to see that the lifestyle they're living is wrong and he wants them to change. Is this helpful to you, folks? God, is there things that I should be doing that I'm not, that I'm being displeasing to you? Because I don't want to, be, I want to be pleasing to you, God. You know, folks, you've heard me say it many times. As when you come to church, say, God, is there anybody there I can minister to? But we could use that in any, I'm going to the store today. God, is there anybody, Lord, you want me to talk to? Help me to be sensitive, God, as I walk up and down these aisles. I'm telling you, folks, you could both, two people could reach for a can of tomato soup or something, and 
you can, set, you can spring up a conversation about your God. Not, not immediately, but you can just get talking. And the person says, hey, man, there's something about you. You see what I'm saying? God wants to use those opportunities. This woman didn't realize, folks, when she was going to the well, that her life would be changed. She went there day after day after day, went home the same. But I'm telling you, when people come in contact with Jesus Christ, and how do they do that? Through us. It should make a difference. When they go home, they should be different. God used me in that way. See, the miracle of God's grace that produces repentance began a work in her heart. The resentment against the Jews was being broken. You see how the enemy does things, folks? He, he uses these things, and, it, and it, hinders, it hinders people's ability to get to Jesus. But here, because Jesus, this Jew, strikes up a conversation with the Samaritan, and the Samaritan knows that the Jews hate the Samaritans. This started blowing her mind. You see, there's a lot of things in our life, folks, that we don't realize that hinder people's approach. You know, I used to live in an area where there was a lot of uh, a certain type of Christians, and you would go to the store and, and just say hi to these people, and they wouldn't even smile at you. So what do the people in the, in the surrounding community begin to think? These people aren't friendly. Why would I want anything to do with them? Well, one thing they re people need to realize is that Christians care about me. Christians love me. So let's blow their mind, folks. Amen? Let's help them to realize that you, uh, uh, Jesus loves you, and he's loving you through me. So the resentment against the Jews started to be, break down, and her lifestyle that she followed became, she realized, was sinful. All because of an experience meeting Jesus. The Samaritan woman had a change of mind that day. The mindset of this woman had been the result of prejudice that she had been taught by her forefathers. The fact that a Jewish man would speak to her was unthinkable. And to further the complicated matters, he offered her water that would satisfy to the extent that she would never thirst again. And also, he reached into her private life and revealed things that only God could know. You say, well, I can't do that, Pastor. Well, maybe not in the way that Jesus did exactly, but let me tell you something, folks. That same desire and hunger that you had to, to live better, so do the people in the world have. And when you start talking about how unsatisfied you were and, and, and how you were seeking after something better in life and you found Jesus, you're speaking to them in their private life. Okay? And that's, and, and folks, when you start talking that way, they're going to like, yeah, me too. See, you have a, we all have a testimony. Right? Your testimony is your greatest tool. Tell people, you know, hey, you know, you're not, you're not bragging yourself up. I was a bad dude. No, but you're saying I was miserable. I felt worthless. There was times I thought of suicide. I'm telling you, when you start talking that way, you're speaking people's language. You know, we look at people and we think they got it all together. I'm telling you, folks, deep down inside, they were probably just as miserable as you were before you came to God. He sees, he reached out into her private life and revealed things that only God could know. And she was so deeply moved that she experienced guilt, remorse, and repentance. The Samaritan woman had a change of direction that day, folks. All of this was too much. 
She had come to, for a bucket of water, not to be challenged about the way her life she, she was living. <laughs> and Jesus revealed himself to her as the Messiah, and it caused a transformation in her life. What's Messiah mean? Anybody? The Savior. He introduced the Savior to her. We need to introduce our Savior to people. Amen? So here, he introduced the, the Messiah, and it caused a transformation in her life. And suddenly, folks, suddenly she felt overwhelming desire to change the way she was living. In, in genuine conversation, there is first an inward cleansing. And next comes the cleaning up of, a, of the outward man. But you got to get the inward man changed. And once it is changed, God will clean up the outward man. Amen? Moral problems, drugs, tobacco, alcohol are a result of inward problems that appear outwardly. Folks, we, we must experience inward change first. And if that change, if that if the change is too genuine and lasting. The most effective way to witness is to tell your personal experience. Your testimony, folks. Use your testimony. The devil does not want you to use your testimony. No. Don't tell people that. He, he knows how effective it is. Folks, you, you, we heard a, a, an awesome testimony up here a couple Wednesday nights ago. If you did not hear that uh, missionary, last missionary, you need to go online and listen to it, folks. That sister's testimony was phenomenal. Okay? <laughs> but I'm t we love to hear those, right? So do other people. The people that you're around every day love to hear testimonies, how somebody used to be bad shape, got became better. That's something that encourages all. You know, when you hear when you hear somebody who was in trouble with the law and spent time in jail and come out and cleaned their life up and, and became a respectable person. We love that kind of stuff. That's just it's just our makeup. We have compassion for people. Well people want to hear what God has done in your life. Be honest with them. I wasn't a good parent. I wasn't this. I wasn't a good uh, ma, uh, uh, son or daughter. I wasn't this. I was terrible. But God straightened me up. God helped me. Come on, folks. People love to hear that. You see, sometimes we don't want to be transparent. But I, I, let, me, let me tell you something. People like people that are transparent. They don't like people that are fake. Let's be what the, to them what God wants us to be. And God wants you to use your testimony to be a blessing in people's lives. Well, I was raised in this. Well, tell of the keeping power of God in your life. That God kept you from all that garbage. Amen? Every redeemed person has a story to tell. And what God has done for each person is worth telling. We never know, folks, who may be longing to hear what the grace of God has done in your life. How different is it since we've known Jesus in the power of the Holy Ghost in our life? Tell people what, they, what God wants you to tell them. You see, Jesus, folks, was compelled to journey through Samaria into an undesirable area for the Jews. He went there. And even his disciples did not understand, or did they, they did not agree with his decision to go through Samaria. Jesus, seeking, knew that he would be, have an encounter with a troubled woman. This woman had multiple problems. Mixed up in her beliefs. Mixed up, living morally wrong. She desperately was seeking help. 
And too many folks, she would hardly be worth the trouble to too many people. Only Jesus knew the intense hunger the woman of Samaria felt and how, how desperately she needed to be reached. But Jesus approached her, disarmed her resistance. Just let people feel the love that would disarm their resistance. Amen? And, and, you know, when you talk about Jesus knew her troubled spirit, folks, one of the ways you can just, when you see people live in a certain way, you just think of how you were. And most likely they are like how you were. Amen? You say, well, I'm not Jesus. I can't. Yes, you, you got Jesus in you. And, and you were miserable. We were all miserable before we knew Jesus. Right? So we got to know they are. So help them. But Jesus, he, he approached and disarmed that resistance. So, you know, just let people know, hey, can I help you? Can I help you do this or whatever? Just show compassion toward them. Overwhelmed by his offer of living water, she could not refuse. And as the light of revelation shined in her darkened soul, she became excited over who Jesus was and his ability to uncover the wrong in her life. You see, this caused her to want to correct her life. She wanted to repent and share the good news with others. She immediately went and witnessed. Come meet the man that told me everything about me. The fact that not everyone will accept our testimony, folks, does not change the fact that we need to witness. Not everybody's going to accept it. But if just one does, it's worth it. Amen? God has done great things in all of our lives. And folks, we must be excited to share our experience with other people. For they need to receive it as much as we need to give it. Ordinary people, folks. We're just ordinary people. Let's let God use us. And what a testimony. God can use anybody if he will use me. Amen. Let's stand. We want to dismiss here quickly so we can get back up here for our, our second service. If you need to run to the bathroom or something and uh, say hi to